so hard. Let's go. So what that was was the brand new Toronto Maple Leaf, Ryan O'Reilly, spending his very last moments, minutes, hour, whatever it may be, as a St. Louis Blue. Blue? St. Louis Blue? Is that the singular for being on that I team? Guess. I've never thought about that. A blue. Being a blue. Yeah. <laughs> I guess, yeah, because, I mean, it's like you're a leaf, you're a blue. So, Unless you okay. have the blues. <laughs> Not anymore. Not when you're getting out of St. Louis. Right. So he uh, he spends his last day with uh, a kid from the Make a Wish Foundation. Do you have the name stuff? Yeah, um, Hank Walker made this wish back in 2020 after being diagnosed with posterior your three year old valves, blah, 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 something that led for uh, to a kidney transplant. And yeah, yeah, his wish came true. Um, his his hockey hero he, that that's what he wanted to play hockey with his hero happened to be Ryan O'Reilly. And his last day is the blue. There she goes. One day contract. Oh, so cute. That's awesome. Good for Ryan. And uh, that's what we're going to start with. Welcome to the Toronto Maple Leafs, Ryan O'Reilly and Nola Kari. Is it a Kari? Uh, Achari. It's a Achari? C-H, because I think it's an Italian last name, the double C. Makes I was going to say, it, it uh, looks uh, Italian. Yeah. Achari. Achari. But, yeah, no, just this clip essentially sums up the kind of guy that Ryan O'Reilly is, right? Like, he is an ultimate leader, um, goes beyond <laughs> to do things for the community. I mean, he's won a Lady Bing. He's a Stanley Cup winner, Conn Smythe, Selkie, one of the best two-way forwards in the league, on the dot as well. Come on. This is exactly what we needed. Yeah. I mean, we talked about this back. Uh, we pulled the two episodes up. It was December 15th and 28th, I believe, are two episodes. Uh, they're marked in the description of them as Ryan O'Reilly and Ryan O'Reilly again. Yeah. So we we did talk quite a bit about this. I know there were a lot of names floating around there, but uh, finally, we find out who Dubas has been uh, sneaking around about. So the Leafs acquire Ryan O'Reilly and Noel Achari. From in a three-team trade with St. Louis and Minnesota. St. Louis receives Mikhail uh, Abramov and Adam Gaudet, Toronto's first-round pick in 2023 and Ottawa's third, and Toronto's second in 24. Minnesota receiving Toronto's fourth. And with that fourth, they get Josh Pilar and another 25% or half of the half of Ryan O'Reilly's contract because... Uh, to sum it up real quick, every team can only retain 50% of a contract. So by involving a third team, they get another team to take on 50% of the 50%. Leafs winding up with a 25% retained 1.875 cap hit Damn. captain. So uh, lots of, ca you know what? The thing that I wanted to say about this, and I know I'm going to criticize it, even though it's a Leafs trade. All I can say is it's a good thing the salary cap works. Yeah, <laughs> right. If it's in the Leafs' favor, honestly, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's in the Leafs' favor, but like honestly, the Leafs giving up a fourth round pick is just because the salary cap exists. Like they don't care if they have to pay him one point eight seven five, or I mean, it's prorated for whatever how many games we've played up to this point. But they don't care if that's three point six or one point eight. They, they, the money means nothing to them. It's the cap hit that they have to make work. So really they just lost a fourth round pick because of the salary cap when really the point of the cap of having them not spend the money, it, it was irrelevant here. So it's just another example of why the cap is stupid, not to get into it too much, but that's, <sighs> it's really dumb that the Leafs lost a fourth round pick just because of the stupid salary cap. And Minnesota essentially bought straight up a fourth rounder for 2024 because they're like, okay, 25%. I'll take that deal. Uh, maybe it'll work out. I don't know what was going through their minds. I don't, tw yeah. 25%. Sorry. No, it's 2025. <laughs> oh, 2025. Oh, there's so many yeah, the picks involved in this team. trade. eh? Yeah. Let me look at what they have left. Because that's actually kind of... I didn't realize it was a 2025 pick. I'm going to look at the Leafs cap friendly. What do they have left for picks? So... Well, the first is gone. 
first okay. is gone. They still have uh, they have a th conditional third. Um, Arizona has the option to exchange the 2025 second round pick for Toronto's 2023 third round pick. So Arizona might steal that pick, but potentially the Leafs have a third, fifth, and sixth this year, and that's it. Next year they have a first, fourth, fifth, sixth, and two sevenths. And then in 25, they have a first, third, fifth, sixth, seventh. So they're missing a lot of picks in the next couple of years, but they still have their first the next two years. They just do not have a second for the next three. I don't know about you, but do you risk it for a future, you know, for winning time now? Because this core is ready now. Like, it's supposed to happen years ago. But if it isn't now, when? Because also Dubas is up. Like, do you give those picks up or save them? And they could potentially be busts, right? Like, even though it's a first round pick included in the trade, that person is probably not going to break the NHL till like 2027-ish, right? 2026, maybe, earliest. And like, do we have the time to wait that long? I Right now, I don't care about 2026, 27. I exactly. know in 2026, 27, I will care and be like, I can't believe we traded whoever a couple years ago. We're going to know who this first round pick was. I don't care right now. I really don't care. We have such a huge draft pool that's going to have a set for the next couple of years. I'm not concerned about who the Leafs first round pick a couple of years down the line is. If they're tanking, like say none of this works out. And in a couple of years, they decide to blow it up. They're going to get all of these picks back by getting rid of these guys. So I'm really not concerned about them not picking if things go south. As long as things are on the up and up, spend it. I'm tired of sitting on these picks. Dubas has had his time to draft. We have a massive pool of prospects that everybody's excited about. We were able to get Ryan O'Reilly without moving really any of them. They got rid of Adam Gaudet, who barely even played, barely cracked the lineup. And Mikhail Abramov, who, I mean, was kind of a middle-of-the-pack prospect as far as most people were concerned. He wasn't at the top of the list. Lower tier, I'm, in my opinion. Yeah, I'm I'm okay with this, like 100%. And that... It, means that they still have prospects and players to move. They have their first from next year. I know it might be crazy to spend two firsts in the same season, but I mean, look what Florida did. They don't have any, and I know it didn't work out for them, but yeah, it's, it's not impossible for a GM to just go out and spend the moon because the Leafs are still, I'm looking at it right now. I know it was about four and a change yesterday, but I think with uh, Samsonov being hurt and then the emergency loans and everything. They're sitting at 3.67 for um, deadline. And yeah. I mean, if you can pick up Ryan O'Reilly at 1.875, 3.6 is so much for Dubas to play with. I don't think he's done. I know that's, we'll get into that because that's been a lot of people's questions is whether he's done or not. I don't think he is because he has so much more to play with and to spend. But uh, I really like this trade. Um, let's get into what Ryan O'Reilly does for the Leafs. Yeah, and Olakari, but um, I mean, tonight was obviously the first time we got to see them play. Uh, I missed the game. I made plans long ago, not realizing any of this was going to happen. Actually, let's start there. So, Steph, you and I both did uh, the same thing in postponing Valentine's Day till Friday night, thinking that <laughs> uh, all clear. You know, I know we're approaching deadline day, but nothing happens late on a Friday night. Lo and yeah. behold. Um, Got home and uh, had about 150 notifications from every single platform. <laughs> Ryan O'Reilly's a leaf. That right. was a, a little bit of a shock. I got it about uh, 45 to an hour late, and it was like, whoa, I've since starting to cover the Leafs as intently as we have, I haven't missed anything that big by that long. And it's like, it was really jarring. <laughs> Yeah, I was in shock. Uh, first, I, you know, you have to check if there's any, um, you have to check for authenticity of the post, right? That was my first thought. My <laughs> oh. first thought was people started sharing this, but it's fake. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to get excited about this until I know. Yeah, and I didn't want to get punked, and it's so Marty, easy to get looking punked. at you. <laughs> right? But, Marty changing his picture and named Elliot Friedman, Lisa Kumo oh Meyer, you God. dick. <laughs> 
I was pleasantly surprised, even though we brought him up several times and kind of leaned on the favor that maybe he won't be a good fit because we don't necessarily need him on a third line. And we were thinking for his value because he carries a seven and a half mil cap hit that Leafs simply couldn't afford him. And we weren't expecting this double retention plan happening and such. And if it was going to go that way, I thought it would be so expensive that it wasn't going to be worth it. But with yes. what Dugas ended up spending on it, I think I think what we take for – maybe not take for granted, but we maybe what we underestimate is though the Leafs are up against a wall uh, constantly when they're trying to make these trades, the, like the St. Louis Blues are up against the wall trying to get rid of Ryan O'Reilly. Like it's kind of the balls in their court, right? Like yeah. they have to either move on from him or just burn the season and not get anything. So, I mean, I'm sure people are lowballing them because, you know, it's it's kind of on them to take whatever trade happens because they have to make the trade. The Leafs don't have to acquire Ryan O'Reilly, right? They can go somewhere else. So I think in grabbing him before Timo Meyer comes off the market, you really get to underpay for him. I think that's why Dubas was able to get away with uh, not giving up some of those prospects that were coming up, like Nyes and uh, and such. Look, I'm not saying he didn't spend a ton. Like the first and and second and third and fourth are essentially gone now. But yeah. in what he got for it, I think it it was a very good value trade. And uh, yeah, I'm just gonna say it's because he was able to pull the trigger on this before some of the bigger names like Timo Meyer and Jacob Chikrin go, because that's gonna really, you know, once. Meyer's gone. St. Louis is now going to have all the teams that missed out on him looking their way and start a bidding war between each other. But at this point, it's still, you know, uh, yeah. on the Leafs to make a good offer. That's exactly it. Um, <clears throat> for what you pay for Ryan O'Reilly, you take that all day long. Uh, when we were talking it pr about it previously, it just seemed like it wouldn't work. But tonight we saw Tavares on the wing. Uh, Ryan O'Reilly on PP2, uh, killing penalties. We also had Noel Atari in the mix, which is, for me, the ultimate cherry on top. And I know Beaner has mentioned him several times on this pod last year, this year. Like, this this guy is the type of player you need in your bottom six. He enters the Leafs, you know, leading in the hit category category immediately um second behind matthews in blocks uh he's not afraid to shoot i mean tonight he had five shots five hits um with 1730 right on the fourth line this guy was a wow. beast um for me tonight especially the, he played on a line with zach aston reese and kerfoot it's like it gave them a whole new life uh zach Heston reese i i really was sad for you missing this johnny because you've been saying how disappointed you were you have been in him recently right and tonight I mean, he was all over the place but just like underwhelmed i don't know i haven't been like yeah. oh he's a staple he's got to be in the lineup like just not sold yet but i'm glad so he was playing first, well yeah first period three shots on net for czar like they had multiple wow. opportunities to the point when we were in the third period and they're up four one, might as well start playing the fourth line a bunch and evening out the time on ice. Uh, Cause if you look at everyone's time on ice, it's literally 14, 15, 16, 17s across the board. It's kind of, it's all, all good. <laughs> yeah. And so really just, just getting into what Ryan O'Reilly does for this team is, I mean, we saw tonight it, it allows the, team to spread out more it gives them the depth we talked about the bottom sixes last episode and how the Leafs just didn't stack up and we needed that this is like the best possible thing you can add to your depth right like just looking at what he brings I mean through 64 playoff games Ryan O'Reilly has 56 points 22 goals Ooh. and 34 assists that is insane like yes he has 691 points through 978 playoff game or 978 regular season games but it's his playoff numbers that are like he's almost a point a game that's yeah. insanity and nolachari brings in 54 games of playoff experience yeah he's only got seven points through them but he's been in the playoffs every year since 2015 16 and it's been with the bruins and the panthers so it's yeah. teams that know what they're doing they're bringing experience and i'm just glad that it's impactful people and not you know 
all the bottom of the barrel, you know, what we were able to scrounge up, what was we could afford, you know, it's, it seems like they really spent on something that was going to make an impact. And that's what I'm the most happy about. Yeah. Uh, collecting captains once again, but this time around, I feel like this captain is obviously proven. He has that dog in him. Like this guy doesn't like to lose as uh, Marty pointed out tonight on Twitter. And these two players understand the difficulty of the Atlantic division, especially Nora Chari, right? Coming from the Bruins, the Panthers, like he obviously plays a certain style for a reason and he stuck to his guns. And this is what Sheldon Keefe, I'm sure Dubas is preaching to him as well. You know, like they were saying it on the broadcast tonight. It's clear. He knows what his role is and he does it so well. And it's just so nice to add that 54% on the dot he's averaging. Ryan O'Reilly is around the same, um, at the same pace but that's one of his lowest years in his career usually he averages near 58 59 percent on the dots so for a puck possession based team oh my god this team's gonna be on fire like no disrespect to Holmberg like I, I praise him but at this time period time is now to tighten it all up get everyone familiar with one each other one another and no no more loose ends um, I'm just looking at Ryan O'Reilly's awards voting history. He has been nominated for the Selkie and Bing. So 2010, 2011 Selkie, 2011, 2012 Selkie and Bing. These are just like votes. Uh, 2012, 2013 Selkie, 13, 14 <laughs> Selkie, Bing, 14, 15 Selkie, Bing, 15, 16 Selkie, Bing. 16, 17, Selkie, Bing. 17, 18, Selkie, Bing. Yeah. 18, 19, Bing, Hart, wins the Selkie, wins the Smythe. 1920, Selkie, Bing. 2020, 2021, Bing, Hart, Selkie. Last year, Bing, Selkie. This dude is nominated for it every single year. <laughs> that and is insane. Both of them. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's nice, right? It's so nice to be able to have this conversation and not just have like a an outlier year. Or even though he started, he was drafted by a, or um, Colorado, goes to a pretty poor Buffalo team, and at the time, Colorado wasn't the greatest team either. Those were the dark years for them. And There's a reason they have the players they have now. <laughs> yeah, and it's truly remarkable of how his career has been formed and the progress he's been through. And now he's a Leaf. He can play his thousandth game as a Toronto Maple Leaf if he plays the next 22 of the final 27 games remaining. That's wild. Oh, my God. Yeah, so and... Sorry, this is such a random, random thought, but I noticed when looking at the pictures today, he rarely smiles in his pick. Like, he did on draft day. He did when he, yeah, he got signed and whatever. But today, he had the biggest smile on his face for his team photo, and it was so nice because every other year, he just looks like a scruffy, miserable like, bear in a sense. But yeah, he's hometown boy. Got asked after the game tonight, you know, did you ever see this coming? And he's he said no. Like I dreamt of it, but I never thought it would ever happen. He was a second round pick. I didn't know that. Yeah, thirty third overall, I believe. Yeah, Nolachari undrafted. Wow. Yeah, he started and later. ELC at twenty three. Yeah. What? What? I noticed that looking at his stats, I'm like, what the hell? This guy's 31 and his stats only start at this period in time. And I'm like, oh my God, he's like another bunting in a sense. Yeah. He signed with the Bruins out of Providence College, NCAA for a couple of years. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. I'm excited. And I honestly thought Adam Gaudet was going to be next up, but obviously yeah. things happen for a reason. And I was I was happy with the rotational Marnie Marley like bottom six going ons, you know, like one day Joey Anderson, one day the next guy. But if we have solid guys like this, then there's no more worrying in a sense. Like you can always 
put in someone else to give them a spark once in a while or a rest if someone's injured. But yeah. yeah, and I think it's more important to give the younger guys a chance. Like when you've got Adam Gaudet, it's almost like he's taking up a spot of the Marley's top lines because he's going to be obviously night in, night out more consistent than some of the younger guys, but it's not giving them a chance to really take on responsibility and be in those top roles down there. So I think it's the obvious choice to move out. Um, the thing that I like about O'Reilly is like going back to the, the Selkie and Bing thing, like because he's a two way player, it's somebody that fits into the leaf system that they've been trying to cultivate, which is responsible forwards and, you know, playing a 200 foot game. You know, we've seen it from Matthews and Marner and Nylander and like, they've all been really improving on that end. Tavares was already good at it, but I'm glad they found somebody that already fits that instead of not that Timo Meyer doesn't, but it's just, I feel like he's just kind of a, like a Kawhi Leonard where it's like, we're just bringing in somebody who's good at the game. I get it. Kawhi Leonard won the championship for the Raptors. It's a bad comparison, but it's more just like, this guy's really good. We're just going to bring in the guy that's really good. This is somebody yeah. that's good and gels with the team. Um, I, there's A, the hometown vibe, and B, I'm drunk, so I'm listing things um, alphabetically, and C, <laughs> uh, he he just he plays that full defensive game. Like it's It's nice that the Leafs have responsible forwards, especially with how much emphasis has been put on how – unresponsible irresponsible some uh some forwards on other teams <clears throat> vancouver are <laughs> edmonton <laughs> uh winnipeg it's all canadian teams wow uh at going back and playing defense so yeah yeah i don't know i'm, I'm happy and today the lines like the bottom six you had czar achari kerfoot or sorry ingval camp yarn croak and then czar achari kerfoot it felt like it didn't feel like we had a fourth line. It kind of felt like we, uh, Chris Hurley's idea of having like a, a one A B and then a three A B sort of line combination, of because our first two lines are elite. So <laughs> to say, yeah. uh, obviously, I didn't get to see the game. So O'Reilly wasn't the third line center. They put him on the second line and bumped Tavares to the wing. Yeah. Which is the thing that we all talked about and said, like, that's kind of crazy. What, in your opinion, do you think that's the better move than spreading him out and putting him to third line center with, like, Kerfoot and Engvall? You know, they did have their chances tonight, the first period. I mean, the first shift alone, <laughs> O'Reilly looked great, had two chances. The thing was, JT, it was clear that he's not used to playing on the wing. and. No the only time that would really happen is like what team Canada games where you're playing with a bunch of superstars out of position or something like that in an all-star game or whatever. But he was a minus one JT. He had two shots, three hits, but I don't know. I saw a lot of complaints online. I think it's still possible. They can gel. I, I'm not against putting um, Ryan on the third line either. I mean, Keith said before the game, he has, unlimited options now with the capability yeah because just looking at the the daily face off here so first power play jt marner nylander riley matthews second power play o'reilly bunting yarn croak sandine lilligren that's disgusting i th like the fact that you can spread o'reilly out to your second power play center is crazy like while yep. also stacking the first line with four forwards. <laughs> yeah, seriously, uh, it was such a big improvement tonight, especially starting some of the power or one of the power plays at least with the second unit. And you didn't feel like, oh, you're kind of waiting for the core to come out and save the day, sort of thing. Like they were fi firing on all cylinders and. Um, O'Reilly got his first apple tonight as a leaf and he that was off a of Michael Bunting goal and yarn croak assist. So it's it's working so far. I mean, obviously so much has happened in the last twenty four hours and they had to fly today and do everything right, but I think it gets better. Well, what I really like seeing here, um, it doesn't match what the line combinations were supposed to be tonight, but uh the most time on ice for a penalty killing forward because Lilligren had the most team-wide 
Nolachari, over a minute tonight of shorthanded time. And uh, Ryan O'Reilly with 30 seconds of shorthanded time. So I'm glad that Keefe is immediately trusting that these guys know what they're doing and putting them into high responsibility positions and, and leading the effort there. Because, look, yeah. it's, it's a game against Montreal. You can kind of throw everybody in and say, great, how does this work without uh, easing everyone into it? Throw them into the fire. What happens? You've got O'Reilly leading your second power play and your second penalty kill and your second line. Yep. A uh, true leader through and through. And Achari is the cherry on top here. I love it. I love it. There's more to come, I assume. But tonight was great. And I'm really sad you missed it. <laughs> Me too. Oh, my God. Uh, but played some fun games. Um, did some board game night stuff. Nice. So, you know, it was a good time. Yeah. There, fun fact. Uh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. I was going to talk more about uh, Ryan O'Reilly. <laughs> No, what fun fact, do it. Ryan I, can't remember, Ryan. I was going to talk about the game we played, but I can't actually remember the name of it. Oh. Well, Ryan O'Reilly, number 90. First time in Leafs history, Ooh. number 90. So that he's a little piece there. He'll uh, forever hold with him. Also, he's a no-visor player. If anyone did not notice tonight, there's only seven left in the NHL, and the Leafs have two of them. Can you wow, guess the other one? Fun. Is it David Camp? No, nope. it's a grandfathered um, in thing, so they've oh, been around a little Simmons? longer, right? Nope, uh, Jordy Ben. Jordy Ben, there it yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, Achari's number fifty-two. Who last wore fifty-two, Roscoe? Oh, when was it? A uh, while ago. Mm. We talk about him often, some sometimes, but he hasn't played with the Leafs for a good while now. What era? It's like he never. It's like he never leaves. He's just a uh, always a Leaf. What era? Through and through. Um, early Matthews days, right before Matthews as well. Ooh. Kessel days. Fifty-two. Yeah. You got Def this. Defenseman? Yes. Um, Everyone's screaming at home right now. Mm Martin Marinchin. Martin Marinchin. <laughs> no way. I yeah. Like, I, Marty I, Marinchin. I couldn't picture it, but yeah, that's... Oh, yeah. The era when I was actively not watching the Leafs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just getting scarred uh, even more. Oh, we're trying to lose this season. Great. Call me when it's the draft. Yeah. <laughs> Let me know who we get. Yeah. I'm not I'm not hurting myself all year. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you've played this game before. It's like kind of like a combination of a bunch of different games, but there's like a stack of cards and you, you draw a bunch of them and you have to... It's kind of like the, the, the pyramid game and charades and taboo but like you have oh. to you have to get people to guess what word is on the card and you can say like anything as part of the description that it gives you um but then the second round you have to do it as charades and the third round you have to do it as just one word oh. so it gets like harder and harder i've probably just seen that game i don't know but we have a huge cabinet of games. We always bring a ton of games to every game night. Like a, we actually pack a miniature suitcase when bringing the games. <laughs> oh my gosh! So many, but uh, yeah, no, I, I uh, love game nights. I was in college during the height of Cards Against Humanity, so my mom for a couple nice. of years just was getting me like the expansion packs for it. So I have like the Trump and Hillary pack, the Weed pack, the '90s nostalgia <laughs> pack, the '80s nostalgia pack. Like so many of these different ones. They're fun. It's just I have a lot of cards for that game. You gotta buy the the hardcover um little case thing to pack all your cards in. I have it, it in a bigger blacker box. We can buy a case for all the games so they're not all over the place. That's Hello. what we had to do because it was just getting out of hand. So now we just what? you open up the case and there's like 20 games you could pick from with no 
boxes. You just grab oh, it and go. Cool. You'll have to send me that. Yeah. Um, do you know the, the the big box for the Cards Against Humanity card? Yeah. And the secret yeah. card? Um, we usually play Disturbed Friends instead of Cards Against Humanity. Yeah. Because it's funner. And I have like the X-rated version of all the games. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but anyway. Anyways. Um, so what Leafs I won. think. what? Yeah. Leafs won. Michael Bunting had a great night with two goals. Um, anything you want to chat uh, as far as the goals go? Because, I mean, we've got more to talk about um, as far as trades and stuff go. All I want to say is that, of course, Josh Anderson, certified Leaf, Leaf killer. killer. Certified. Um, oh my God. Uh, 13th goal of his career against the Leafs, of course. And yeah, um, this all starts in the second period. I mean, the first period, there were some great points. Uh, it just seemed like nothing was going in or they missed the net or ding off the crossbar, right? <laughs> but something super funny, I just, before I forget. In warm-up, Ryan O'Reilly is doing his pregame ritual, and then he showers himself with his bottle, which happens to have BioSteel in it. Oh, no. <laughs> so he's covered in pink shit. He's like, what the hell? Looking down at his hands, and like, am I bleeding? No. Wrong water bottle, bud. That's <laughs> Couldn't funny. Couldn't read the label. So he had to shower himself with the water and... uh get on with this way but that didn't affect his play because like i said earlier the first shift was buzzing second shift buzzing leafs were on their third line change and hab still had their first line out they just made their change oh a Lord. minute and 30 in because the leafs just hemmed them into the zone so much going on deflection ding like oh my god shots 16 13 to end the first period oh, and with that let's start the show <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's way too late to play the intro. I just realized we hadn't done that yet. And it's like half an hour in. Yeah. <laughs> it's I like, did, I did have you ever seen those it. shows where the cold open plays out and then the intro starts and you have to like literally check how long into the stream this is? It's like, we're 12 minutes into the episode. It is far beyond where you're allowed to play the intro. You missed that opportunity. Let's, yeah. Don't, don't do this. Don't do this. Anything well, past like three minutes, you missed your chance. <laughs> it's the for worst for... Uh, I think it was How I Met Your Mother I noticed it the, the most, when it would be like beyond a cold open. It's like an entire scene plays out. They change locations. They go back to the apartment, and it's like, oh, first commercial break, break so let's play the intro. It's like, no, 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 no. You can't do that. <laughs> play it at the beginning, man. Uh, well, for any uh. new new listeners, welcome back to Leafs Late Night. Presented by yeah. Inside the Rink. This is <laughs> Steph the Fanalist. I'm with Roscoe, who uh, forgot to click the button. And now we're back to the game. Yeah. <laughs> now we're back. Um, oh, yeah, you can, you can finish up with the game. There's more, like I said, there's more trade stuff I want to talk about, but I missed yeah. this. So <clears throat> I'll get to see the debut of these guys tomorrow night. Yeah. Leave second period. Oh, my God. Three goals from the Leafs, one from Josh Anderson, which honestly, Wall had no chance. It was deflected in front, through traffic, a point shot from Matheson. Anderson just got the dip. And of course, uh, he's certified. Just stamp it on his forehead. Certified Leaf killer. Boom. And it's one sort nothing. Of, he, I don't get it. It's so frustrating that somebody, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't get it. He he has such a mediocre <laughs> season, and like all of his goals come against the Leafs. It's like he's paid five million dollars just to be good for a couple games against Toronto. Okay, I saw a tweet, but I just gotta check real quick. Where is his name? Josh Anderson only has six assists this year, so he's played fifty three games. He has twenty one points for fifteen goals and six assists. Like, come on. Damn. I know. I can't believe he's just not a playmaker. And I get not being a playmaker and not collecting assists, but like, how do you not get more than six secondary assists? Like, the amount of goals Suzuki and Caulfield were scoring, like, he's just so far removed from anything going on there. Yeah, exactly. Uh. But the good thing about this second period, too, to right after to answer to Josh Anderson, the Leafs 
convert on their first power play opportunity, which is always a good sign. We want them to sink that shit real quick, get the gears a-flowing, and it happens to come off PP2. So Bunting gets the goal, Sandine dumps the puck before entering the zone, and Matthews collects it around the boards, cross-crease pass up and over Allen's shoulder because Bunting is right there down on one knee. 17th goal of the season, man. Good news for Bunting. Um, I just got to shout out um, the Habs on Reddit account on Twitter, r slash Habs. <laughs> Guess what they said about the game tonight? Did we cheat it or something? Leafs are about to get their first win in three games versus the Habs this season, and all it took was Monaghan, Gooley, Gallagher, Slavkovsky, Evans, Edmondson, Jack Eye, <laughs> Caulfield, and Doc to be out with injuries or sickness. Impressive. Very nice. Well... Habs have also allowed at least four goals in the last seven of 11 games that they've played. They just lost to Carolina 6-2. And what the fuck is going on? Uh, Marty looks really pissed behind the bench. He looked mad the entire time. And I don't know, man. It's a problem when your newest people, like your your prospects are coming in, your, your rookies are kind of carrying the game for you because you have Harris who just signed a deal. Um, they also had P- Pizzetta who's also a beast every single game, but he's also a rookie. Um, there was another guy on D who actually tried to challenge Matthews after he dropped Suzuki, but kind of accidentally like Suzuki just fell on his ass. So uh, Kovac, Kovacevic, Kovacevic. And Baron and yeah, what's this guy's name? Shuna, Shunaman, Shilonen, Belzeal, Har- like the amount of people in this game that I've <laughs> never heard of. That is so unfortunate for the Canadians. Yeah. I know you're trying to lose, but like, my God, that sucks. Yeah, Matthews literally smiles him off of him when he tries to push him. <laughs> like, yeah, okay, but like, who the fuck are you, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, even but, at 30 shots, Montreal was reduced to, like, 8 and 9 in the second and third period. So, it was yeah. like 30, 41 to 30 shots. Well, good thing oh you're here God. tonight because Pierre Ingvall shoots the puck. Mm-hmm. Alan saves it. <laughs> it sneaks through. <laughs> Oh my god, you gotta watch this replay when you get a chance. It literally drops between his legs and it trickles and he does like a backflip to check and it's in. And we're all shocked. <laughs> oh, oh man. Giraffe well, power. I've got it. I tried to watch it, but there's an ad. So I'll catch uh, it in yeah. like six, five, four, three, two, a couple seconds. Um, <laughs> So how did uh, obviously we had we found out that uh, Ilya Samsonov? Okay, actually, here I'm just gonna watch the goal first. Um, okay, so blah blah blah, Engvall fighting in the corner because he's big, Chad Engvall. <laughs> oh my god! See, that's how Engvall should be scoring: slam somebody in the corner, go give me the puck, I'm bigger than you. Yeah, and just throw it on net, like just force your way through. I don't care if that created a rebound or went in the net. That is exactly what Pierre Engvall should be doing. I hope he does more of it. And I hope that's what playoff Engvall, play, yep. Pierre Loff Engvall, Engvall looks like. So uh, Nuno on the, on Twitter was like, oh, no, what no. is Pierre Engvall going to bring to the playoffs? And immediately after, Pierre <laughs> Engvall scores. So we were saying that, that he, yeah, he, he summoned the beast. Uh, the beast was unleashed from Ingvall tonight, and it was always nice to see, especially when you have Bunting, Bunting, Ingvall, Nylander, Kampf. All four lines worked. All four that's lines awesome. sc- scored pretty much, right? And, and that's what you want out of a trade, is yeah. like if, especially if you're trying to bolster everybody, right? Like, it's it's hard to bring two guys in to affect four lines, but that's really what Dubas did. Because you can yeah. spread people out and put them in the spots they're supposed to be instead of filling holes where you were lacking. And I think this was a, the best possible, you know, move with the least spend. I did not think he'd get this much for that little out. A uh, Achari could have had a couple tonight. Uh, that similar play, like Ingval there getting in front of the net, Achari was all over that tonight and throwing his body around with five hits. Um 
And then David Kempf, right? Third period goal. I know Nylander scored before him, but it's always just this cherry on top for me when David Kempf scores first in 28. So it's nice to see these types of guys get activated again and put on a show for the new guys and say, listen, okay, this is the type of play we're used to. And this is the expectation. Goals come from everywhere. And we're going to continue that. Yeah. Um, just to, to end off our trade talk here, um, especially the O'Reilly one. And then I want to talk about the goalies. Uh, I posted a poll on Twitter yesterday, right after the deal saying, is this deal enough to get Dubas an extension? And from just under 200 votes, have you seen what the results are? Uh, no, actually. It's stayed pretty much um, the same from about, I would say just under a hundred here to just under 200. And it's 69% yes, beautiful trade, 31% no results or bust. So, I mean, it's not like it's completely one-sided. I would say like 70-30 is still enough of the audience that not everyone's convinced. And I wouldn't say it's just like, you know, a couple people that are just being negative. Like it's a fair point that, you know, you can make this trade, but until something happens and they're able to actually turn this into success, it, it it's hard for that to mean something. But as far as Dubas's extension goes, I mean, the trade is all he can do. Like the actual bringing in of players is the only thing he can affect. Like everything's in motion as far as the decisions he's made. It's all on the players after that. So I think it's hard to say that the results are on him. I think he has done with this trade and probably one more enough to show like he's worth keeping around. Like it's, we're talking about extending somebody. We're not talking about like, you know, are they the best ever? Is he the, the most fantastic GM on the planet? I don't know. That's not what we're talking about. Do I want him to keep being the GM of this team? Yes, because I don't think there's anybody better out there right now for us that's available. Yeah. No, seriously. Uh, for the price, you can't turn it down. And um, even tonight, Ryan O'Reilly was 12 out of 14 on the dot. Uh, oh my gosh. What? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, Noel, Noel was, a, was a little bit less. I think he was four out of 11, but honestly, a he little. always were. But he recovered, you know, and like he had a presence on the ice and he was noticeable. So 36% I mean, on the dot, but I think that gets better with time. Yeah, and it's hard to be impactful and noticeable in your first game. And the fact that both of them were, you know, in such high responsibility roles, like I said, Achari was killing penalties. He had the, the most minutes of any forward on the penalty kill tonight. Like, they at least trust him. So that's yeah. something. Um, Joseph Wall getting his first win at the Scotiabank Arena. Um, yeah, yeah, so Sammy out with an illness. We find that out just before the game starts. So nothing to be concerned about. It might be a bug. I think it's maybe like a like the flu or something. The bug forcing the e bug, eh? <laughs> yeah. Which uh, Sarah in our Discord pointed out that the Leafs are over the maximum amount of contracts, but uh, it's listed in red because emergency call up. So there is Shalgren, baby goalie, backing up Joseph Wall. And the Leafs obviously had to send down two. So the only two who were not wa or who are waiver exempt are Pontus Holmberg and Wayne Simmons. So oh they go down to make space. We have to call up the two goalies. We have one on emergency loan basis. And here we are hoping that Sammy feels better soon so we can smile with him. They also moved Matt Murray to long-term injured reserve. So all I can take from this is they're just going to let him rest up to be their tandem slash probably the backup heading into the playoffs. But I think it just it allows him to get back on to 100% and for them to make some moves here. Like, it's, it's gymnastics, it's dumb cap shit, and it's an injured goalie. So... Eh. It's a good combo for them right now. I mean, I don't hate it. It's just silly. I'm just going to go back to how dumb the cap is that they have to have somebody <laughs> take a rest in order to make trades. It's like, yeah. Ugh. Do you want to go to questions? We have a couple here. Yeah, I was just saying we're getting a bunch here like late. So I'm glad oh. we're, we're like, getting to this. There's nice. been a ton of them come in while we're recording. 
over um, the last half hour. Sheldon Keefe, also 150th win uh, wow. as a head coach. Yeah. Uh, but um, okay. I, I just want to say one more thing before we get to the questions, because just yeah. based off your poll there, uh, I had a thought in mind, then I lost my thought, but it came back. 30% Good. of people, right? Um, I kind of don't blame them, right? They want to see the results or bust because we were once in this position where we gave up a first and others. Nick Felino comes in, captain of the Columbus Blue Jackets, complete bust. Or, well, he was injured and it just didn't work out, right? Like it just. Was he the captain? Yes, he was the captain. Yeah, he was. Holy. So, and there was the whole historic thing with his father being a former Leaf and everyone was so hyped. So, do people stay on the hype train, which is, you know, mentioned in one of our questions? You might as well, Mike at Mike the Fanatic says, are us Leafs happy fans- birthday, Mike? Happy belated birthday, Mike. Yes, missed ya. Are us Leafs fans overhyping this team after the trade, or does this team officially feel different? Realistically, how far do each of you think they can go this year? It's it's a fair oh. question, right? Like. Are people overhyping it or what? Like, is this another captain to our collection that's just going to collect dust on the IR shelf because he just came off of IR? Or will he be impactful along with his fellow former Blue? Like, half of the league has been on IR this season. Uh, <laughs> it's it's either, like I said, a cap maneuver or it's people have just been getting hurt a lot. It's a physical game and they're giving guys a rest because I think it's becoming more uh, commonplace to just, if guys aren't 100%, instead of putting them out there and potentially hurting them more, just throw them on IR, call somebody up. You've got so many players and you're so restricted with how many you can have up. It's almost an opportunity. It's a blessing in disguise kind of thing every time somebody gets hurt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But for the question, um, overhyping this team after the trade, I mean, we got to stay positive. There's so much to look forward to, especially with his cabinet of trophies and endless nominations for the trophies, right? I think overhype is the the wrong word. I think it's just people weren't expecting him to swing for the fences. Like, I know it's been talked about, like, Friedman has been saying, you know, Leaf Nation, like, watch out. He's going to make a big move. There's going to be a blockbuster here. But, you know, we just, we never see it. It's always been, like I said before, the people that you're not expecting. It's something out of left field. It's never the top names. Uh, we talked about O'Reilly being unaffordable, you know, multiple times. So yeah. I think it's fair that people are shocked and excited about this because it's not something he typically does. And that means that he has the confidence this year to spend something that he wouldn't normally spend. Like, I mean, if he had the same confidence last year, we would have gotten, who was the big name at the deadline last year that I'm forgetting? It wasn't huge, but. Um, good question. There was somebody. There was a lot. I can't remember. The de- well, last summer, anyways, the big ones were Huberto and Gaudreau and Kachuk, and but for deadline purposes, and, yeah. Um, you I'm know, trying to remember who the Colorado, big was. yeah, and like Tampa and Colorado acquired bottom six players that really helped them send them over the edge. And some D like Josh Manson, for example, for the for the Avs and um, who was it for Tampa? Here I'm looking at deadline last year. When was it? Buh, 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 buh. It was like February, wasn't it? Yeah, it's uh, two weeks. Oh away. no, no, it's March, March third. But when did they do it last year? It was late. It was March twenty something. Yeah, here. It was like March 21st last year. Oh, um, okay. Max Domi, Victor Brask, Tyler Mont, Nemesnikov, Broussard. Um, Mark Durant. Andrew Kopp. Andrew Kopp. Andrew Kopp. Yeah. That was a big one. Riley Nash. Arturi Lekkanen. Yeah. So it wasn't John. Lekkanen. Yeah, it wasn't like, yeah, Capo Kakinen, Marc-Andre Fleury. Brian Little. Oh, yeah, Flurry. Yeah, so it was like, it wasn't a big, 
first line forward though. So I think that's why this year it was like, everybody was just expecting it to go somewhere else. You know, Boston always yeah. gets the toys they want. That's why we're allowed to be excited about this. Yeah. Yes. We have to wait for the results, but as I said, this is Dubas's job is to, you know, b between now and March 3rd, make the best moves he can. And it's up to the team to do the rest. And I think he's put them in a really good position to spread everybody out, play the, the spot that they are the best at with the amount of responsibility they were comfortable with. And I think it's going to lead to great results in the playoffs. So as far as how far I think they can go, uh, Eastern Conference final against the Rangers is going to be really hard. Yeah. Honestly, does this team feel officially different? Um, it's too soon, I think. It was super nice seeing two elite lines just going at it and no holes. I, I mean, we saw JT tonight, and it's not like he was horrible. <laughs> he still did his job, and um, everything was, was great when Leafs won. But give it at least 10 games, right? Like, just to gel with the boys and maybe test Ryan O'Reilly on the third line center just to see or play around yeah. a little. And yeah, but... Obviously, it does feel different. Um, I feel like Nick Foligno was like a Ryan O'Reilly light in a sense. And this is like the real deal this yeah. time, right? Like Nick Foligno's worst game or best game is probably Ryan's worst game, in my opinion. So, And, and yeah. with what we saw from St. Louis last year where, every, what was it, eight or nine guys had over 20 goals. Like yeah. the potential's there. This year, they just can't find it and they're falling apart. So I'm glad that we're getting him before it's been too long removed from his good years. It's yeah. uh, it's just been this season. And honestly, being hurt, I'd rather him be hurt than be with this garbage team for the last 50 games. <laughs> He's not going to have uh, any, any goalies swinging at him. He's not going to have <laughs> any hot heads yeah. or anything. But uh, uh, realistically, obviously, I think the Leafs can go all the way. I On paper, they are <laughs> solid and on on ice as well. It depends if they want to play the right way that night, right? But uh, Atlantic Division is the it, hardest. Yeah, I just think it's going to be once the, if they can get past Tampa, um, it's going to probably be the Boston and then Rangers would be mm -hmm. the, the route, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and yeah. I think that's going to be really, 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 really hard. Like Tampa is probably the most beatable, uh, followed by Boston and then the Rangers, but they're pretty close there. Like with the moves, the Rangers have made to bring in, um, Tarasenko and the fact that they've got Shesterkin back there, like their defense is that little bit better. I, I just, I'm scared of playing the Rangers now, man. It's crazy. Yeah, we have it's Shesterkin, Vasilevsky, Allmark. Great. Allmark <laughs> is having a good season. He's not a fan. I don't know. It's, no, don't I, I mean, him. it's, it's hard. crazy to put him in a conversation with those two. But yeah, this year has been insane for him. Yeah. Um, but okay. The Other next questions. question. So just going off uh, Ryan O'Reilly, Mikey D asks, now that he is a Leaf, uh, if he stays, what does his next contract look like? This is interesting because he's 32, so he's not in like end of his career mode where he's going to sign for 750K or 800, whatever it is next year. Uh, but I do think there's a world where he takes – a couple mil to stick around. Cause I mean, at 32, he has had quite a few years of making between six and 8 million a year that maybe he would rather stay here, especially if they find the success in the playoffs, um, make yeah. it through a few rounds. Um, I could see him sticking around. If it's a first round exit, I don't think there's any chance, but uh, if he has a really good second half of the year here and they go on a deep run, he could do it because He's not going to get that. I mean, you're really starting over again if you do that somewhere else. Um, he's an Ontario guy. I I think it's possible that they could work out a deal. It's just a matter of does that then force your hand in a year or two with your Nylander deal or your Matthews deal. So I don't yeah. want anything that's going to hurt that. So I'd say the the most you can give him is like $3 million And you got to get rid of somebody like, like Kerfoot in order to make it work. Like if, if you're bringing O'Reilly in to replace Alex Kerfoot, 
a thousand percent because he's that but better and more consistent mm -hmm. um i just it's going to be on o'reilly whether he wants to uh take that hit in his pocket to uh to stick around with the leafs yeah Akari, i think is the uh the more interesting one to resign because if he works you can get him on a an engval like deal and a couple of those guys were all running out this year so it's it's going to be kind of up to dubas who he wants to keep around for the bottom six too many clowns in the clown car. We did not give up anyone yet besides some Marlies. So got to make the decision. Uh, the ability, you know, to play center was an attractive aspect about Kerfoot, our, our utility knife. Now we have Achari who can play center as well as Ryan O'Reilly. So you got to, you kind of got to pick because also on the PK, you, the Leafs have Marner, Ingval, Kampf, ROR, Achari, Yarncroak, Czar, right? And it's like you gotta make the decision now, the hard decisions of who who's staying and who's going. And as we were speculating who's going to the Leafs, I think we all agreed on it, ha like or hoped, anyways. I remember I said, I hope it's a hometown boy so that they can take a discount because Kyle Dubis said he's only gonna go after people who are interested in staying, and. O'Reilly already said Toronto was on his short list of teams he was interested in when he's going to test free agency in the summer. So now he's getting okay. a sneak peek. Yep, sneak peek um, early. And he has the option of staying or not. Uh, and it has to be a good, friendly, team-friendly deal. He has to have the dog in him, like Bunting, who's also going to take a team-friendly deal to play with his boys. And yeah. Live at home, the dream, the childhood dream. Play your thousandth game as a Toronto Maple Leaf, retire as a Leaf. But to do so, like you have to meet us halfway. Please. Please. The next one Please. comes from our very own J. Bean, Justin Bean. Ooh. The Beaner. Uh, how will the other teams in the East match up against the face-off prowess of the Leafs now? So if you didn't catch on our last episode, we matched uh, the Rangers, the Devils, and the Hurricanes bottom six up against the Leafs. Uh, sorry, the Bruins. Um, I think they, with the addition of these two guys, like I was saying, it's it would be nice to add somebody to the top six, but they really need it as the bottom six. This somehow covers all of those bases with sending the least out the door. So I'm I'm fine. I I think they're going to be more on par with Bo uh, Boston's bottom six, where it normally feels like their bottom six is is kind of taking ours out to lunch, and uh, it's kind of on the defensive the whole time. We're just trying to clear the puck. I feel like we can actually generate some offense now and get some scoring from the bottom six, which is something that other teams have over us still. Yeah, and especially on the dot, right? We're already seventh overall in the league. Uh, 52.3%, but watch that number just go up, and especially oh, our power play. Last game, we were sitting at fourth. We dropped down to six again, 25%. Now that we have Ryan O'Reilly on PP2, it's, it's it's lethal, right? It's lethal. You have Bunting being a little snaky snake in front of the goalie. You have Yarncroke ready to shoot that at any point. Sandine with the blast. Now you have Ryan O'Reilly and Ingval. Come on, bunch of shooters. So bunch of shooters. Yeah. Um, next one comes from. Let's go to at Vi Blue and White Zapper. Do you think the team was stoked about the new toys Dubas got them or what? And do you think Dubas has a couple more up his sleeve? Uh, as we've said, I think he does. Uh, just because he can. Pardon me. Yeah. Uh, do I think the team is excited about them? It's hard not to be. I think adding somebody that's a name like that, like Ryan O'Reilly, that's a captain and somebody that all of them have played a ton of games against. <laughs> Come on. It's hard not to be excited about that. Yeah. Um, I, I believe Gio said today when asked, uh, his his response was that, 
he was worried about who left the team, honestly. Like, he wasn't worried about who's coming. They're worried about who's going. And that's the mindset of this team, right? Uh, they're, they're all friends in this locker room. So obviously they're super ecstatic. Even Gio said, like, I'm just glad we didn't lose anyone at the end of the day. So today is a good day for the buds because they're only adding at this point in time in the future. Tears may shed, especially if, you know, Kerfoot is out the door, for example. I think it's going to hurt for some, but it's the business. And that's exactly what they'll say. It's it's the business. Yep. Um, next one comes from Ryan Williams at, at, what is this? At 1706 Ryan. So can we forget about the Columbus game? I just called this one Wall's first game of the season. Yeah. What Columbus game? Yeah, what, what, what? We didn't even talk about it. Next. (laughs) Um, uh, Run it back forever at TML Fan and Van, a.k.a. Marty Zilstra. Is Ryan O'Reilly good at, and I'm going to do it, hockey in air quotes? (laughs) What kind of hockey? Actually, Ryan O'Reilly is... um, I follow the St. Louis Blues on Instagram as well. He, they always post clips of him practicing, you know, using a ball against the wall um, with his stick, just fucking around, not even fucking around, just, just playing around with his hand-eye coordination. And he's really good at what he does, using different types of weighted balls and, and such, like kind of like what goalies do, but he does it with a stick. And of course he's good at hockey. Come on, he even has a hockey smile. <laughs> so the answer... Yes, yes, Ryan O'Reilly is good at hockey. Thank you for the question. Good one. Yeah. Uh, next comes from Benito, the Basset Hound. What's it like to have a five-on-three power play? I forget. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize this until somebody pointed this out on Twitter. Uh, the Leafs have not had one, or they've had one? Yeah, so they've had zero so far this year, whereas the Winnipeg Jets has has had three in their last game alone. The Leafs have not been off on a five-on-three advantage, and they should have been so many times. So this is our tinfoil hat growing once again, and I'm totally with you, Benito the Basketball. That is insane. Um, he says, I'll, I forget, I'll stop now. Had some wisdom <laughs> going to bed, catch the show in the morning. Y'all rock. You rock too, Aww. Benito. Also, yeah, you did you see how mad Austin was after dragging the puck out of the corner with two abs on his back to pass to the, to backdoor Bill for the tap in? I don't think he realized they were going to call a penalty. Yeah, man, this this was a nice goal, and uh, William Nylander tonight almost did the um, thing he did last game nine seconds into the period, the first period. You know, wrap around the toe and in. His attempt didn't work because Allen squeezed, but this one, man, I don't know how Matthews was able to feed with all that traffic, cross crease, did not miss. Manlander is, he's evolved, okay? <laughs> they show the stat tonight. He's averaging, what, 1.17 points a game, and um, throughout his career, those numbers just steadily went up. Last year, it was 0.99. Damn. William Manlander. Last part of Benito's uh, question. Can I get some dogs treats? Uh, can I get some treats or is it only Dangle that does that? So, does Dangle give dog treats? Um, Isn't that victory puppy thing in the beginning or does he give away? I don't know. I haven't watched one of those in a long time. We'll send you some treats. How about that? How about that? How about that? Send us your address. Send um, you some doggy treats. <laughs> That's all the questions I have. Um, I just want to say Mikey D had a fun question. What's your favorite banger from Marty Zilstra? Oh, I've shuttered it out before, but there is a song that I'm always finding myself going back to. Everything on Boom Chick is sweet if you're trying to get into the game but there's one from his older ones oh my gosh it's from Isn't the dragon it called music there's one called, no, it's called moon moon sorry from or there's the one called the spider whoops 
There's one called The Music that's really cool. I enjoy. I totally agree with you there. The whole Boom Chica album is awesome. Of course, Rattle the Glass is elite. Um, I don't know. I like all of his music. I'm very fortunate enough that where Marty sometimes sends me uh, music clips of songs that he's creating. Yeah, same. Yeah, and I really enjoy that. So thank you, Marty. I appreciate that. And uh, check out his music, guys. Marty Zilstra. I like this one because it's spacey and like. Oh, the sweet, sweet voice. Yeah, it reminds me of Animal Collective, but it's better than <laughs> Animal Collective. Yeah. He's cool. um, so, um, anything you want to close out with? Because I just have one little quick thing. Uh, nope. Tomorrow the game is at 6 p.m. Eastern time for anyone who is not aware. And we will be in Chicago. So, Sweet. Yeah. Monday's family day. Ooh. But, uh, no, good game. I'm glad we got the points against the freaking Habs. But, yeah. Heck yeah. Freak yeah. Um, so I got Hogwarts Legacy. Did I talk about this in the last episode? You spoke about this. I don't know if we were recording or not. Okay. Sorry if I talked about this already, but now that I've put like 12 hours into this game, I have <laughs> an honest review of it. <laughs> okay. like, I've had it for like a week. Um, that's normal, right? <laughs> so <laughs> it's visually stunning. Uh, the the actual landscapes and the buildings and the lighting and everything. I'm playing it on PC with a pretty good graphics card to be fair, but it looks really, really good. The faces of people like NPCs aren't great, but the actual world looks gorgeous. Flying around on a broom is like so cool. It's so satisfying to hop on your broom and fly around and cast spells. (laughs) And like the amount of spells you can get, it's, it's just a very, satisfying hogwarts experience like what you'd expect from being a wizard or witch um the side quests are fun there's a lot of like stuff you can do there's a big world to explore if you're into the the potter world where i don't like the game is the Mm -hmm. actual and and this sounds crazy but like the story itself is not that great even though the game is really fun still like i'm gonna finish it and i'm gonna enjoy all of it except for the few main story quests like there's so many other things you can do and explore but like the actual things that they lead you down that they've written for this game don't make a lot of sense it's supposed to take place 100 years before harry potter and you're like oh this kid who joins as a fifth year student who can see ancient magic or something sorry there's going to be spoilers if you want to get through the game um i'm trying i'm gonna try not to spoil too much but like you can see ancient magic which there's like these old magicians like left behind clues and you're supposed to follow them to like find this thing that they hid and it's like why is if this is a hundred years before harry potter why is, does none of this come up through like the seven books like hmm. like it, it there's some things that they took liberties with and i get it but like this just seemed like it was out of left field and they, they make you, it's main character syndrome where you're like, oh, you're special and you can see things no one else can. And you have to go on as a special journey. It's like, no, I just want to be a student. <laughs> I just want to like go to class and cast some spells. I don't want to do this. How is the soundtrack? Does it live up to the high, you know, Harry Potter has a crazy soundtrack. They've done obviously or- orchestrated um, concerts for it. Now, does this game have similar soundtracks? Yeah, I mean, you get the Hedwig's theme, like the John Williams, the na, 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 like all the time. Yeah. Um, to the point where it's like a little repetitive. But it was kind of the fact that it, I took note of the fact that you can recognize an entire franchise by a short little melody that John Williams wrote, which is really cool. And you did that for, you know, Star Wars and E.T. and Jurassic Park and all these yeah. different Home Alone, like everything that he composed for it, you can literally recognize the entire franchise by the actual nice. little melody. But um, the the game, yeah, the music's good. Um, I like how it, it kind of changes based on what you're doing. And 
I don't know. The fact that they, they built out the world around the school, like there's a bunch of little towns around, like there's not just Hogsmeade, there's little hamlets and stuff you can go to. And I don't know. I like exploring and like doing fun stuff and finding treasure and things. And I just don't like being special. <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> Well, they just made it seem like you were just like you get to go to school and be a student at Hogwarts and do fun shit. Because like, oh. sure, like Harry, it, I don't know. Harry's supposed to be like special in the sense that he's special because his parents like saved him, and this guy wants to finish off what he started. It's not like he was born with like a yeah. gift. The fact that you're like born with this thing, and you're just like yeah. inherently good at stuff. That just, I don't know. That just makes me feel like I don't, it's hard to, I don't know. I guess games are a lot about immersion. And when you feel like you're starting with a leg up on everybody and you have some, some special task that like nobody else is a part of that, like you have to go do on your own. You can't talk to anybody about it. It's just, it's not very relatable. And I know being a wizard isn't supposed to be, but they're supposed to, you have to at least like draw parallels from things to be like, you know, if this was my life and I was a wizard. Well, what I've been doing. <laughs> All that said, I give it like a, a seven and a half out of 10. <laughs> There's a new show on Netflix called Perfect Match, which is literally another reality TV show that I have a guilty pleasure for. And. It has all previous cast members from other shows. Sorry to change the topic <sighs> on you, but what? like all of the contestants are either from Love is Blind, The Mole, Too Hot to Handle, or something related like that. They're oh all my from next. Yes. Oh Four my episodes. god. Send me yes. This. Oh my god. And it's a dating show. So they're all dating each other. <laughs> And but some of them are from Love is Blind. So if you like it's interesting, they're different worlds, they connect. And if you're a big fan of reality television, it's like kind of like RuPaul's Drag Race, uh, All Stars. It's like all your favorites come come together in one show and you're like, Yay. <laughs> you know what other shows like that is uh, X on the Beach. It's a British one that they started doing in uh North America, but everybody on it, like the whole premise is that you go onto this island on a resort or whatever it is, and they, they bring people in one by one. It's the same as any other of these dating resort shows. But um, once they have the like core eight or 10 people on, everybody that gets added to the group, like every episode, like a boat will come in with two more people. And it's their exes from the shows that they were on before. So they're all from like Big Brother UK and like all these other MTV shows. And they'll like bring on the people that they had drama with from other shows to be like, oh, fuck, it's my ex-girlfriend. It's like, what? Oh, no, sorry, babe. I'm going back with her. It's like, what? You guys have been together for like three weeks. It's like, no, nah, it doesn't matter, babe. She gets me. I'm just weak wow. for her. <laughs> this show is the exact same. Whereas five girls, five boys, half of the girls and boys have already been to with one another. And they admit that oh, straight up to the it. camera. <laughs> And, and already they choose to elect new people to come into the house and literally every single time they've had a previous relation with them or they were on the show together <laughs> or like something fucked up <laughs> and they have to vote someone in but they have to stay in a relationship in order to stay in the game so it gets really cut throat there was know. a show that we watched on youtube last year it was like uh it's called reality house and it was like kind of the same thing. It was just people from YouTube brought together to do this big brother type show. But one of the guys on it was Peter from season two of Too Hot to Handle. I don't know if you watched it. He was like the guy with like the, the like yeah. the brown hair who was like the little like short king yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, he, was, he was like the big name that they got for the season of uh, Reality House. It was so funny. I haven't watched that one, but. Uh... Yeah, they even have winners on the show, like Joey from season one of The Circle, the winner is on this show. Like, it doesn't matter if you've won or lost in the past. And If you came know. here for hockey, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. You just stop paying recording. I know, you didn't even get our intro, and the outro is just non-existent now, and uh, sorry guys. <laughs> yeah. Well, um... Thanks for sticking with us. Yeah, thanks Appreciate for all you. the questions. Oh, and I on that, the video. Send, me this, 
we got to watch this show on Netflix before I lose Netflix, because uh, I think in like a couple of days, it's going to lock to my parents' house. And uh, oh, I don't want to do that. Only four episodes are released at a time. It's shitty. So now I have to wait for the new one on uh, Tuesday or whatever. Fine. Like, okay. if they won't well, let me binge. Mad. Bullshit. <laughs> well, let's get out of here. Thanks, yeah. Steph. Thank you all for the questions. Appreciate it. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Join our Discord. Watch us on YouTube if you didn't catch the last ones, because uh, we're going to start doing more clips and stuff, and those are way more fun when you can see what we're doing. Bye! Uh, bye! Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Leafs Late Night, your night of post-game podcast. Available after every game on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Audible, and more. Ryan O'Reilly is a fucking thief. Kiki.